All right, so a question that was given to Caterpillar Inc. is why are almost all tractors and heavy-duty tools painted yellow? And a representative from 2015 until now says from Caterpillar, it has been an industry-wide practice to adopt yellow as a primary color of construction or earth-moving equipment. However, this is not the norm and there is no standard requiring this to be the case. Aha! So it has been raining all week and our YouTube gold mine site is flooded right out. We have to bring the waters back so we can even maneuver the equipment around there. So what I did was I broke out Project Johnson, my lesu, big huge excavator. And all week I have been painting pieces for it. It almost looks like I have an excavator and I butchered it out all processed here. Look at this, their largest excavator they offer. I have been painting it all week. I brought in special automotive paint. Everything is looking fantastic, look at this. So I decided to go with a red, black, brass, and, um, and chrome look. Look at this, like a stainless steel. Everything has been painted. The details still need to be done. This is just preliminary work. But look at this. On all of my parts, I always make sure to do front and back. The reason why is because you never know when you're going to open up a door and show the inside. So I always make sure to do all sides of every piece. That way, when you have a good look, everything looks like it is straight from the manufacturer. Now, I have built a Lesu excavator before but this is their most giant model to date. So as a helpful tip or trick for anybody that is going to tackle a build like this or any RC build, uh, what I do is I always take the hardware and I always lay it out in sequential order according to size. Like all of these are my screws. You'll see the one point whatever's on top, then the two point whatever's on the bottom, and then three, the sizes go up in sequential order. Then I start laying out all the associated nuts and bearings that I'm gonna need, all the way down into the pins and whatever I have left, springs and whatever. You can always find it and it's quick and easy to get to. Now if you're new to my builds or just tuning in, I always suggest using like a Gatorade lid or a bottle like that just so you can get some blue Loctite or thread lock. And the bonus of these kits from Lesu is that you do get your own tools. These are actually fairly decent hex drivers right here. Plus you've got some nut drivers, an extra 1.5 mil uh, piece that you can put into your driver handle, and then the tiniest little screwdriver available. I would say uh, that you would also need a 4.0 nut driver. You want to get yourself some needle nose pliers. You may need a small hammer uh, and a razor blade. Let's get started. So idler wheel the holder and the tensioner. So this is actually going to be a track tensioning wheel. And what we need to do is identify the brass piece, identify the bearings, get the spring, the pin, uh, the drive pin, and the, uh, the actual wheel itself. Now for viewers that are new to the show, when I'm doing a complicated build, I like to lay the parts out, everything in a row, so you can see how it goes together very easily. So here's the rod, this is actually gonna hold the spring, which is gonna go through the U-bracket. The U-bracket's gonna have a bushing on either side. This idler wheel is gonna have a bearing on either side. That idler wheel will slide into the hanger right here. We're also gonna have a pin that goes straight through on either side and has a set screw on, on both sides that are gonna hold it into place. Okay, so first things first, the very first start, I'm going to take this threaded rod right here that has a flat spot, as you can see, and I'm actually going to start twisting it into the hanger. And I want to make sure that when I stop twisting, the flat spot is on top and on the bottom. Why? Because I'm going to run one of these set screws in here. And yes, I am running a little bit of Loctite on there, a little thread lock, not too much. Wipe off the excess, and I'm also going to put one on the back. A new hobby enthusiast don't know that if you take a small amount of grease, stick it on the inside of one of those uh, collared bushings, you can slide that into its area, and it will stay. It won't slide out, so that's very helpful if you're working on 
any of those collars. They also have holes in the collars that have to line up with the outside hanger holes right here. That's so a whole set screw can go in. Once that's completed, I'm just going to go ahead and slide. Now the tolerances are like within a micro millimeter. Look at that. Slides right into place and I want to make sure to line the holes up all the way through so I can stick that pin right where it's supposed to go. Here's where I'm using a longer grub screw, but I try to use as little thread lock as possible. So here is the spring that goes over the outside. I don't really need that yet, but I'm going to leave this just as is. Let's switch over to the carrier. Ah, just look at that beautiful paint. I've been letting it cure for days. I know a lot of people are upset with me right now. They wanted me to do the typical cat yellow and black, but I am anything but typical. I love entertaining people with all different types of radio control hobby equipment. And if I can make something look extra cool with a serious paint job, uh, especially with heavy duty equipment, I'm gonna do that. Over here, I will need some track carriers. Uh, I'll also need the track rollers which means I'm also going to need an M38, but a countersunk uh, screw, so I'll need those. And I'll need some of these bearings, and some of these bearings. Notice that uh, what I'm going to do here is put in some waterproof grease. Why am I doing that? It's not required. It doesn't say to do that in the, uh, in the actual manual but like I said you never know what kind of weather your excavator is going to be in so I'd rather have those bearings protected. So 10 by 6 by 3 and then this one slides in the same way but it goes in too easy you almost think it's the wrong one but all you need to do is just kind of countersink it in there. And then of course what I'll do is I'll put some grease on the outside of these bearings as well just to make sure that they're always maintained and lubricated well. A lot of people may say, hey, you're gonna get grit on the inside of that bearing, you know, it's gonna wear it away, but I'd rather have that chance than to have one kind of just rust up on me and seize. And then one, two, three, these pieces are gonna go in where it is countersunk on one side. So pretty straightforward, just push it through. You'll see that it's a beautiful flush fit right there and any kind of grease poking out the other side, I just kind of wipe it off. Then I'm going to be using the M3 number eight countersunk screw, and I'm gonna just start introducing it to this roller. And the reason why is because it becomes quite a challenge, especially with everything is slippery and there's a bearing in there that it starts to spin. So I found it was best to use a cloth on one side to hold it nice and tight. That way you could snug up that roller and then ensure that it rolls freely. I want to know right now, I know the beginnings of builds are boring. For the people that are watching right now, please make an effort to make a comment down below. Let me know if you're watching at this point in the video because YouTube tells us that people tune out of these build videos after two minutes and then nobody ever actually comments on anything. So if you could do that for me, that would be awesome. Enter the bottom rollers. Beautiful. Okay, proper grease on that, on either side. All right, before any rollers are gonna be installed, I have to put the uh, idler wheel and tensioner in place. So this is going through here, through here, and then there's a hole in this final one. I'm just going to adjust it so we can get it in place, perfect. Then I can put a nut on the end of here and that's actually going to adjust the tension on the track, right? Like if I get a rock or something go inside the track, it's going to be able to move this idler wheel so it doesn't break the, uh, the actual track itself. Okay, with all of those ready to go and the uh, track tensioner in place, I'm just going to seat all of these even though they don't sit perfectly flush with the pin but this kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. These are going to be the bottom guide rollers for the track. I'll open up all of these pins. 
Now, every hobby builder is different, and although I don't suggest using a hammer in the hobby that often, these pins that come are, the tolerance is so small that they actually have a very slight problem I've noticed fitting through the bearing. And, or, or not even just the bearing, just the outer, uh, the carrier right here. So what I'm going to do is put that roller in there. I'm going to use that small ball peen hammer I have. And then get that into place. Problem solved. Look at that. Look at that. Then on the other side, you can wipe off all the grease that may have come out and attach these all with the E-clips that were provided. All right, so once those E-clips are in place for the roller, make sure that you can actually roll each roller freely and it's time to install the sprocket on the end. This piece is just so beautiful and it's weighted so nicely. You don't have to put together the gears that come inside. This actually comes as one unit. Uh, it is a brushless motor. As you can see, there are three uh, pins on the end and uh, we're going to be running those wires a little later on. But as you can see, <laughs> we are ready to mount this up. So it will be going straight through like that. Okay, so M2 number 8, and they are going to be these silver little fellas. 14 holes for the sprocket, so 14 screws that need thread lock. That was easy. And to finish off the rollers, we're going to have the top piece like that with four little screws. Now I know you guys came here for YouTube Gold today, so I better make this extra special. No one asked for a 12 minute video. You all came here for a longer video than that. And I'll tell you what, I built the other one off camera. Let's move on to the main part. A quick little shuffling around here, turn these around so now you can see the sprockets are towards me. Beveled uh, motor on the inside on either side, making sure that they are both the right direction up. I can go ahead and take this top mount, if you guys remember the unboxing, it's quite heavy. And I can simply attach these down. They've got four screws on either side on each leg. And then I can take the swing bearing and the slew ring and attach it up on top. So 32 little bolts later, the top part is now attached. I like how they're bolts and they're not actually screws. It just makes the authenticity a little bit more, you know, easier to believe. Okay, so off camera, I did add some oil all the way around the swing bearing and I'm just making sure it can turn. This way it can have a 360 degree rotation on that turret and uh, you never have to worry about losing signal because of how the electronics are set up. Is a ring that makes a connection all the way around. Now have a good look. There's four, five uh, holes on one side, five holes on the other side. You can see here in the middle of the ring, same thing. So you want to line up all these holes with either side and then you can drop the screws in. Beautiful. Lined it all up on the outside. M312. You know, as I'm tightening these screws, it often occurs to me that there are many people out there that said, you know, they would never even attempt a build like this. And I want you to know, it is not as intimidating as you may think. As long as you lay it out and you can identify your pieces, as I've kind of shown uh, as we go along here, have confidence in yourself. It's just a step-by-step -step process. It truly is. Okay, and as a side note, I did add some grease uh, to the inside of the teeth of the gear ring there, as you can see. This is just to kind of help aid in better smooth operation, maybe deaden the sound of the turret moving left and right. Uh, I know I don't want to add too much because it'll attract dirt and grime and small rocks over time. I don't want that to chew out the teeth, uh, but for smooth operation, I think it's worth it. Okay, now this is a little bit weird for me because I have wires sticking through for the motors for the actual sprockets on either side, but this doesn't show the wires going anywhere. It just shows them being cut off. 
Now in the smaller version, they actually have the wires routed through this plate that go into the track and you don't see any wires at all. But when you come over here and have a look at it, this is very different. It's almost like they expected this notch right here to what, like hold that in like that, but then it kind of kinks the wire a little bit and then I'm going to have wire exposed on the outside. I wish they would have run it through. I don't see any way to do that. There's no holes all the way around, so that's basically what I'm left to do. Hopefully that doesn't damage any of the wires, so I'll have to be very careful. If you're building along with me, also be careful. Okay, something is not making sense about this setup to me, because once I was finished this, I'm like, okay, well, what about these extra long cables? Like, where are these supposed to go? Normally, these would have been running in the track. I don't want them anywhere to be around the rollers. And the only thing I can see here is, you know, like this small opening, which is not big enough to get, you know, two of these through, let alone three. And I thought, well, maybe the ends were put on before... You know, like maybe I should, I didn't put these on, these came from the factory, but maybe these should be redone and I wire these straight through. And then I looked at this one over here and this one's got a hole behind the track. You can't see it, it is right back there, but it is also too small for the ends to be put on. And I'm thinking, ah. Oh. Dang! <laughs> so what I'm going to do is because this one is set up differently and I can't actually drill a hole straight through here because of this, the, uh, the, the bearing in there, what I'm going to do is actually make this hole a little bit... Hello, what is this hole? Aha, uh -huh. let me see... Okay, I'm taking off the bottom plate as an experiment because at no point in the instruction book does it show you how to route any of the uh, wires so far. But I'm wondering, look at that, there is a hole right there, but I don't think it's going to be definitely not big enough to slide this through. I'm going to have to remove that whole piece now just to see how it can fit in there or if it can. Okay, now this makes way more sense. Hopefully if you're going to be buying one of these units, you'll end up watching this video first. And you'll see that in here, there's actually two slots. There's a slot on the inside right there, and on the other side. That's where you're supposed to route your wires, and they actually come out through these holes on either side. These are for your track motors right here. Okay, my table is littered with screws that had to be uh, undone, but that's no big deal. To get to the right job, it's worth doing properly. That small area, you if you try really hard, you can get all three of those male connectors through there. And what they're supposed to do is come up through here. So you'll see that I've done that. Now it's behind the wire and it comes up through here, which will now be able to connect to the wires over there on the plate. And once everything is cinched down, that makes way more sense. I'm glad I stopped and used my brain because I'm like, why would I have to drill holes? That's never an option. Well, for those that are building along with me, I'm sorry if I led you astray, but this would be a super important part of the instruction book to include, uh, that this video will include, that the book at the current time does not. So here's how that wire will come up through. It connects, it runs underneath, and same with the other side. Don't worry about connecting the wires up in any specific order as this is a sensorless brushless setup and you can fix that when you install the original uh, ESC. You don't have to worry about any of the wires. Okay, now let's uh, push all this back into where it needs to go and reinstall the top plate. And here it is. Quite a heavy piece. All the way around, no wires exposed. The bottom plate is now on proper. Time to get out the tracks and roll them on. Now the bonus is, is that unlike some other kits, these actually come pre-done for you, so you don't have to build all the links. 
Now, I've decided not to paint these uh, links because I actually like the look of the bare metal on them. I did paint my other tracks on the Cobbleco or Cabelco or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, you know, as soon as you start going uh, uh, across the ground or pavement or, or you turn sideways, it grinds all the paint off of this anyway. So I think keeping with the brass and chrome and black and red, I think this goes along perfect. So total track length when all laid out, 35 inches. All right, so I spun this around so you guys could see it a little clearly. I did it on the other side. And I'm just gonna take this track like I did already, take it all the way down. Remember when we put that track tensioner in here and I'm able to move this idler wheel back and forth? Well, what we need to do is to take these pieces of track and then compress that idler wheel and then pop a pin in place at the same time. Now, I was, I'm always transparent with you. This takes a little bit of conviction. Make sure that you've got some patience and you can handle your fingers getting pinched if, if that's the case. Just trying to line it up there. Here's the conviction part because there I failed. Fail. There's like literally nothing to hold on to. And your timing just has to be just right like that. Sweet. So now that it's in, what I gotta do is take, I'll lay it on its side. So I gotta put the E-clip on still like that. And you guys aren't going to be able to see it, but it's going to go right there. Back over to the parts area where I could grab the steps. Each one painted black, ready to rock and roll. There's four in total. So now with the beautiful undercarriage complete, Ugh, that's got quite a heft to it. We can move on to da da da. Why didn't you paint the hydraulic tank? I don't know. I kind of like the raw look of it. Look at this tiny little hole on top right there. I'm going to slide this magnet into place like that. And then I take the very small, I can't even keep it in focus. It's that, that tiny. <laughs> oh man. I need two hands for this. No, I don't. I'm a professional. I've been doing this for at least three weeks now. There we are. That magnet is now secure in place. What is it for? Here is the smallest little cap for the tank, which can go on top. Threads right in. Now this entire tank is actually going to get covered by an outer shroud. That's why I'm not too worried about having this painted or getting hydraulic fluid mixed in with the paint or whatever. I'm just keeping an extra clean tank. <laughs> I keep getting to go back here. One of these, I get to have the door and what other piece? This piece right here. This is the tank shroud. Okay, then I need the tiny little hinges. And presto changeo, a few small screws, a few small hinges, and you now have yourself a case for the hydraulic tank. But are we done there? Oh no! There are accessories to go on the tank itself, and it includes already self-chromed uh, ladders and protective rails. And look at the assortment all the way across the table. Everything is pre-packaged, ready to be assembled. Here's a really good look at one of the ladder assemblies. Look at that, all metal, ready to be installed. And here's the corner piece on the side. Same thing, all metal, ready to be installed. This shroud, there's two holes here and two holes here, so front and back. This shroud will go over the tank like so, and then the door will open to reveal the magnet. There's another magnet on top here, and then the uh, fill point or overflow point. Not sure which one that is yet.
Now, I'm supposed to find the hanger for the mirror. That looks like it. And then the mirror itself, right there. And then I need a couple of brackets, it shows. Right there. Brackets, that's what those two are for. And that's why there's those four holes in the side of the tank. I was wondering about that. And look at that. The screws are actually right in the back of the mirror. How handy is that? Those two screws are actually going to get threaded into that area uh, and they don't have any, uh, any washers because they screw right into the back of the mirror. Right on. Ah, uh, no. Upon closer inspection, they want you to change those out for the little M2 by 3s So change the ones that come out, toss them, I guess, and change them to the smaller version. Just like that. And then these tiny little brackets. And it kind of tightens on either side. Just bend those two little brackets around. And there it is, the mirror is installed. Now underneath there are two holes. This is where we're going to introduce our first hydraulic fittings. So here they are. These are M5 6x4s. Two of these on the bottom. I'm also going to use some uh, Loctite, the 545 thread sealant for hydraulic fittings. Now with thread lock, remember, a dab will do you. It goes a long way. And just line it up. Flathead screwdriver. Well, with those two installed, that completes the hydraulic tank assembly. Look at this. A hatch, a proper ladder that's attached, the mirror that's adjustable, the outside guardrails, the hydraulic tank cap, all of that now complete. Here is another part of the top that we're going to have to install a door on but first it needs its magnets. Now keep in mind, if you are building along, there is two bags of magnets for a reason. They're opposite polarity, so when you screw them in because they're countersunk on one side, <laughs> make sure not to use the same one or else it'll push away and it won't actually work properly. Now here's the door that's going to meet up with that magnet. Smallest screwdriver ever. Ah! I'm not used to working with anything this small. So a few more hinges and small, small screws and nuts. That magnet already installed. Now I'm just going to install the other hinge on this side and then I'll attach it to the inside part here which will close off this bay. Now these are 1.2 size screws and 1.2 size nuts. Very, very tiny. That looks fantastic. It is going to open easily, just like that. The magnet closes it. The last thing I need on this is the guardrail for the top. So nicely packaged. Well, when all is said and done, there it is. Project Johnson is well underway. Oh, a huge number of steps we got completed on it today. And uh, what do you think? I want to know in the comments section, is this something that you would ever attempt to build on your own? Does it look easier now that I've done a video on it and this is something that you could tackle? Or have you already built something like this? Let me know. Also, what's your opinion on the color? Are you disappointed that I didn't go with the typical cat yellow? I don't think I am. I enjoy entertainment. I enjoy lots of different types of construction equipment. And man, oh man, look at this. That hydraulic tank assembly looks fantastic. This other side, this is gonna be on the other side of the cab right behind it. 
a door with an access panel, or I shouldn't say a door with an access panel, it is the access panel, but with the steps on the side and the top guard rails, everything looking fantastic, my friends. So yeah, I didn't get together with my buddies on YouTube Gold today, but we're going in the right direction. We'll see you in the next episode, my friends. Bye.